Hey, Space Watchers! It's Chiara Monta here, event coordinator in our Space Watch Global team. Do you want to learn more about 21 disaster types, agnostic AI, and how space can aid in disaster management? Then stay tuned to learn more about Mayday AI, a German based provider of real time risk and disaster intelligence. I had the pleasure of sitting down with the CEO of Mayday, Kian Mashahi, for a virtual coffee and a chat about Mayday, the space ecosystem, and the importance to find and relearn that balance and harmony with nature. This is Space Cafe Radio, your channel about trends, cool people, and real conferences. Enjoy! Thank you so much for joining me today. It's wonderful to see you. Can you briefly introduce Mayday and the service you provide? Thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. Mayday is a German based risk and intelligence provider. We are focusing on 21 disaster types globally and on all, all stages of disasters. So, before, during, and after, with a big focus on sort of the before stage, which is prevention, and hoping to create this culture shift that pivots towards prevention and resiliency. Mayday has been supported by the European Space Agency, by the German Aerospace Center. And of course, our journey started with NOAA and their big data program. And we're really proud to see the UN DRR and UN NUSEC also recognize some of our unique innovations and really happy to come off of a week where we've spoken in Australia and, and, and in Bali and multiple events happening at the same time. But we're really proud to see that the work that's been done has been recognized uh, globally. Well, that sounds incredibly exciting. But what does actually differentiate your service from others? Like this UN Spider, UN Charter? So fundamentally, what we've tried to do is, is create a platform that can consume in, in an agnostic manner, imagery, text and audio files, and then automate data around events on effectively first come, first serve basis. You, you're dealing with an industry, to give you some context, that's, that's extremely fragmented. This is due to the evolution of disasters and jurisdiction. You've got global policies versus country level versus, you know, if you're dealing with the United States, for example, many layers of jurisdiction because of it's, it's just pure size. When I started Mayday some four years ago, there was a decision to make. Do I essentially push to invest in, in a mega constellation or create a platform that can consume anything and everything to provide intelligence when it matters? These are some things that are unique about Mayday in the sense that it is built on an agnostic AI engine that can ingest and provide intelligence that's going to evolve to a consciousness. What we've been able to do with satellite imagery, with machine learning, where we have come up with pioneering ways to see through partial clouds with optical imagery, with real-time scan and detection technology that shaves up to 30, 40 minutes of post-processing, and, and the ability to, as you can see with the recent announcements with Airbus and Satellogic and a few others, to bring in different players to the table, this common goal. Ultimately, this industry is going to converge. There's right now this, this dot-com era, if I can compare, of sensors that we're dealing with. And then this has been going on, I think, through the pandemic and will probably plateau in the next couple of years with the economic conditions, the macroeconomic conditions, and the reality of how complicated it is to launch these mega constellations and maintain them. We've tried to forecast that. We've tried to see this as much as possible and try to leverage as much as possible. But yes, yeah, so the uniqueness is, is our agnostic AI engine, our ability to consume and cater to different verticals, and the ease of use. This a platform that's highly intuitive, that is designed in multi-languages. It's something that allows every individual to log in and learn about their home and their historical risk, but also has a dynamic component. So as risk changes, we notify them and keep them constantly informed, plus the ability to update and, and file insurance claims. So there's an insurance partnership that's being announced later this year that brings consumers also to make this platform. So actually, your client base is then very diverse. Absolutely. We're building something that eliminates this fragmented industry. It brings everybody to this ecosystem. There are specialized verticals, as you see, and sort of layers of service. This is a very modular platform where we turn on and off layers of service. So out of the box, we cater to 21 disaster types at unprecedented rates. Our engine is constantly scanning and fusing data. Fusion is becoming very fashionable, but we've been working on this for the past few years and we've evolved this to a sub-pixel level with imagery that's just becoming prevalent and many other innovations that are just showcasing their value when combined together. This integration that made this showcasing is very unique. Right. And now, are these all paid services or are there also free services that you offer? 
The consumer app will be free. We, we want this to be available to anybody globally. Effectively, it's a benefit. In some parts of the world, it'll be a uh, part of an insurance benefit. In others, it's brought in through agencies like the UN and the Red Cross and others. That'll be, just be provided for awareness. Ultimately, as I mentioned, what we're trying to create is community-based resiliency by, by passing some of this ownership to individuals. Where we're headed is quite unsustainable. You're seeing billions of dollars, close to trillions of investments globally into a lot of reactionary capabilities, bigger trucks, longer hoses, you name it, if it comes to wildfires and, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, if you pass the onus to communities, to individuals who understand their own risk, and collectively as communities, you can focus on resiliency that's much cheaper that allows for heritage protection, that allows for folks to keep their insurance at the same rate and, and, and be able to insure their properties and, and takes this onus, this heavy weight, this unmanageable weight from practitioners in this industry if you just look at the disaster management vertical of this. So this is why we think having communities educated and being part of this process from way before is, is of great value. And it's something that allows us to have sustainable practices against what's coming, against things that are just amplifying and, and getting more and more unmanageable. I was just thinking, it's terrible that we have 21 types of disasters. Oh, the UN actually defines 300. These 21 are probably the, the most occurring globally. And, and there's a handful that cause the most damage and the most casualties. Uh, so, so we've tried to look at this from life saving opportunities first, then property and heritage, and then just having something that allows for visibility. Again, understanding something from very early on. So like that alarm that goes on in the morning and you continue to hit snooze, will get louder and louder and louder until folks wake up. So this is exactly what Mayday is going to do for many of these industries and, and, and disaster types. What stage is Mayday in right now? Are you funding the realization, the actual delivery part? Where are you currently at? We had to rethink about some of our global launches because of COVID. Mayday is not just a platform. We have operational centers that are just coming online in South America, in, in Chile, in the U.S., is in California, in, in Europe, is, is in Germany, as you've seen, in Bonn and Darmstadt, and in Australia, we're sort of launching. So our platform is supported by 24-7 services that we've had to basically scale back because of COVID, and now we're very aggressively opening these doors. We've effectively sold the platform, if you like, to, to multiple customers. And some of these announcements are coming for uh, realization at the end of Q3 and Q4 of this year. You'll get to see the emergency management verticals being showcased. You'll get to see the disaster management verticals in a big way. There's some defense and intelligence products that are being released. And you'll also get to see some environmental services. You saw a sample of this with what we did with Loop in Germany for 10 cities with the Urban Green Eye. You'll also get to see some forestry, health management, and delogging products that are being released. So, so we've started to onboard after some, some pilots and, and successful tests in the early process of this year to onboard many customers. And, and Q3 and Q4 were very aggressive opening the doors to some of these customers that have been working with us and unofficially being part of the process. Very exciting stuff. Now, I'm also a bit curious, at least from the, the European space side, because of course now there's a lot of developments, especially also from ESA on their agenda 2025 with the accelerators, where well, one point is also really on this safety aspect and crisis mitigation. Is there a close connection there? What does this mean for Mayday? Ultimately, we are hoping to cater to Europe. Quite frankly, Europe dealt with COVID and, and now there's a Ukrainian crisis that's just occupying everyone's mind. But unfortunately, disasters don't stop. But you saw in Germany with this unexpected flooding. There's a sign of things to come. This randomness that the climate change is generating means everybody needs to prepare for any kind of disaster. It sounds a bit counterintuitive, but this sort of the culture change that, that we're hoping to bring to Europe. We've had, obviously, the support of ESA and DLR to launch some of these and, and to bring a lot of this to continental Europe. But some of the products that you're seeing with wildfires and what I'm proud to announce is real-time flood detection that nobody has. You'll get to see flood detections every 10 minutes. That's the first of its kind at unprecedented rates. So this, these two products alone, plus the heat wave mapping and others, are, are suitable for Europe and, and its immediate needs. Look, it's exciting to see what ESA has done. ESA is, is a very inspiring organization because it had the foresight to think about democratizing data. Its Sentinel series, the satellites, have done tremendous work in, in many industries, and the impact is palpable. You see the Copernicus EMS and their mandate, and they're tasking for select countries based on a certain priority and criteria that many countries are taking advantage of. So Mayday has created something that gives effectively the same priority, the same urgency to anybody, anywhere. The experience is very standard. 
guys in that regard. So so not only do we bring in the Sentinels, but there are some 300 more satellites that are at our disposal that are running through our engine and, and are producing the service our engine is producing different products. So right away, our, our emergency management platform complements what ESA is doing with select countries, but it's limited. It's, it's very important to understand that the European taxpayers are funding global disaster mapping. This is this goes to, quite frankly, the vision that ESA had to democratize this. ESA sensors came after NOAA, NASA, and a lot of other space agencies. And what ESA started sort of was a leading path for many others to follow. At the same time, there's a capacity that taxpayers can, can sustain. So this is where private companies like Mayday and others are coming in and not only filling that gap, but also providing complementary services that will allow for, for users to effectively see so much more than what they're, what they're seeing. And you're going through an era where there was no visibility and then all of a sudden there's so much visibility. So I, I always compare this to someone who's really hungry, but then becomes really sophisticated and, and wants to go to Michelin star restaurants. So that sophistication is happening very quickly in terms of palates. We're preparing for that. We're trying to cater to the sophistication from the consumer side and the scaling of it. To give you some more perspective, Copernicus EMS can support eight or nine countries at the same time. But if you have all these disasters happening simultaneously, some have to be in a queue. And, and with disasters, every second matters. We're, we're creating complementary services that adds value to what, what this incredible service out of Europe looks like, looks like, out of Israel looks like. And quite frankly, you're seeing many European members now starting to mature and, and coming up with their own analytics capabilities, with their own data consumption capabilities. So we expect those layers of service to also be brought into this collective value that's offered for, for Europeans by Europeans and for Europeans for the rest of the world. This is where you see Mayday supporting and, and Mayday being a, a big value differentiator. Now you've talked about what you really can add to the field and how it complements. Now I'm just curious, what would you need from the space ecosystem or from the market? The biggest challenge, believe it or not, is, is not so much the innovation aspects. Because we're seeing what a few people can do in a small team, especially leveraging some of this data that was the biggest barrier to entry. Just a few years ago, if you wanted to do anything that had to do with satellite imagery, there were a handful of players like Planet Labs and others that you'd have to go through a very cumbersome, tedious process at a very expensive process that just didn't have many players coming to the market. The data part is taking care of itself. You're going into this maturity where there's going to be an abundance of data. Unfortunately, what's missing, the government agencies who need to consume this and really do something with it are lacking in processes that has to do with procurement and the resources or the maturity to take these incredible services and translate this to value offerings for, for their jurisdictions and consumers. So this piece has different levels of maturity. You're seeing some resistance from the older players that are very comfortable in what they're using. You have folks who are using maps on the wallpaper maps with ketchup stains on them and they like it to folks who are now just starting to understand what it means to get satellite imagery every 10 minutes. So we're grappling with that where they really need to see it and touch it and feel it and, and at that really delays their consumption. The biggest challenge is consumption in a manner that allows for innovative companies to continue. So you can see this, this incredible flow of innovation that needs to be consumed. Otherwise, you just have this huge line of items that just haven't been tapped to. And, and that has ramifications in terms of how the company survives. And at the same time, the maturity of the company, because they really have to slow down for the market to understand and consume before they can go to the next layers of sophistication. So from a support perspective, if you look at ESA, ESA is, is something that I like to call a conduit, a platform, and a catalyst. So it, it, ESA is truly a conduit for innovation with what it's done with its data and how it's brought in people from, from different parts of the world to create a platform for innovation. And at the same time, what it can do in a very effective manner is, is become a catalyst for the other side to influence policymakers, to influence government agencies to consume these services in a much faster manner. It, it's good to see that it's really heading in the right direction and that there's so much talent and new ideas coming up as well. You said something before, which piqued my interest, because you were mentioning the agnostic AI engine and that it would develop consciousness. And as a technical layman, that sounds awesome. But can you explain that, please? 
Agnostic effectively means you can consume any image, text, or audio. If you look at this in the context of intelligence, our intelligence as human beings is a function of what we see and what we hear. And, and that matures to our consciousness. That becomes our consciousness. A toddler goes through consciousness maturity with intelligence. And what, what artificial intelligence has provided to us is this power to consume data at unprecedented rates, to store data at unprecedented rates. If you look at the human intelligence, look at one brain, two eyes, two ears, our sense of smell, these, these senses create our consciousness. Imagine artificial intelligence and its collective power where it, can, it has thousands of eyes and ears and other senses simultaneously. Artificial intelligence has been around since the 70s, right? This is just matured to a stage and then it just exploded with the capabilities that that cloud computing and, and, and this luxury of storage has, has given us. You have eyes and ears and, and, and a lot of memory to store this and mature this. So just like we build the schemas in our brain and, and, and that becomes our wisdom, these schemas, these AI schemas are, are maturing at unprecedented rates. So these models are evolving as they see more and hear more and consume more. So our brains are agnostic engines. And what we're building as a platform is an agnostic engine that can consume artificially as many images and audio texts and files around an event, around something of, of, that's of our interest that is programmed to detect and, and create content for, but also something that becomes of interest. All right. That does make it more graspable for me. And that it sounds incredible. It's building a brain, basically. That's exactly what this is. This is artificial brains. But billions of brains, trillions of brains working simultaneously. We're outdoing ourselves. We've, we've outdone ourselves in many other, like automation, industrialization. AI will exponentially change that and give us the capability to do things that we've never even thought about. This is where we're headed. I mean, on this notion of very future thinking, this leads me perfectly to my last question, which is what can we expect from May Day in the future? What are the next big steps? You'll get to see some of our regional announcements coming up over the next few months in terms of onboarding our, our partners. You'll continue to see on the upstream side partnerships with many players who are coming to this industry and are recognizing Mayday for its downstream services and scaling capabilities. Ultimately, what I hope to create with this company is a platform that allows for anyone anywhere in the world to learn about their environments and go back into learning how to live in a balanced way with their habitats. Folks are talking about climate Climate change. It's really climate disruption, right? We've had major extinction events as far as we can tell. But what we're doing is, is really disrupting the climate. We're amplifying normal processes, normal things that this planet needs to regenerate and, and, and recreate itself in a very parasitic manner. So our civilizations, if you go through these library books, all the volumes talk about harmony and living in balance. And then all of a sudden, that symbiotic relationship has changed. It's like a shock of a very parasitic behavior. And this is a consequence that we're dealing with moving very aggressively to meet the wants and needs of a very aggressively growing population at a very unsustainable way. Disasters like you're seeing with wildfires and others, many of them are fully preventable. So platforms like Mayday, technology like Mayday, allows folks to have unprecedented situational awareness and understanding of their environments, understanding what they're dealing with, and quite frankly, empowers them to do something about it. We, we're fully in charge of this. We're fully in charge of managing this. So, so this is where I'm hoping to take Mayday, by giving people a tool that, that gives them a, a, a full situation of awareness of where they are, no matter where they are, with the same luxury and the same standard. Mayday will democratize a lot of services that have never been there before in a very easy manner, in a very easy way. And the other piece is, if, if you're looking at a culture change, when you continue, and I talked about the consciousness, culture change comes with what's in front of us, what continues to get enforced over and over again. So platforms like Mayday can help foster a, a preventative, mitigative culture. It can help bring that to reality that's much cheaper, much more sustainable, and much more realistic. If, if folks are thinking of moving to Mars in these clunky space suits and living in these bubbles, because that's sort of the next thing at our evolution, I'm not ready to sign up for that. I'd rather be here and, and, and live on this planet and quite frankly rethink or relearn the wisdom that our, our civilizations have left for us. We just have to go back and read those books again. I think what you said is very beautiful, that we really need to find that balance and that harmony again and to also tackle things before they happen, not to just constantly try to fix the mistakes. Absolutely.
We've never been more advanced. Our civilization, despite the wonders that were discovered by the past civilizations, our, our human species has never been more advanced. It's never been easier. We just have to think about it differently. When you think about harmony, when you respect the cyclical nature of this planet, and, and when you think about nature versus nature, using natural solutions to defend us, then the conversation is, is a different one. It's a much easier one. I think that is really wonderful. Thank you so, so much for this great talk. It was really fun. And I think we definitely need to meet up again soon to uh, follow all of Mayday's developments. Absolutely. Let's make a date for, for next year and, and come back. And hopefully I can share some of these great developments with Mayday and some of the partners that, that we brought to our umbrella. Fantastic. I would love that so much. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. This was the end of our episode, but please don't forget to check out our full program of Space Cafe Radio, where we offer interviews, insights and editorial comments on the space sector. Thank you all very much for listening. And with that, I leave you for today. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Bye. Bye.